Hey everybody, today Rado Talks your episode 49 of the podcast, and this is going to be a very short episode indeed, for a few reasons. One, there aren't that many new games of interest. I've got 15 to tell you about, which is a little on the slow side, although I expect that's going to speed up as we get closer to Gen Con, and even more so as we run into Essen. But, so that's going to be a shorter than normal, and what's worse... I got no top tens to revisit this month. Sorry, folks. I should have already done two new top tens uh, last month, so I'd be able to talk about them now. But things have had to shift around because Jen's going to be gone pretty soon, so we've just been playing games like crazy, so I have plenty to film while she's gone. So next podcast, I'll probably be talking about three or four top tens, but this month there will be none. And then finally, there was a much uh, emptier mailbag this month than... Pretty much any other... I think we've got fewer questions now than all the way back when we started the podcast. So, by all means, folks, if you want more content for this uh, podcast, it's a two-way street. Send me some questions at questions at rotto.com, and we'll cover them next month. Uh, but i, I got to get asked so before I can answer. So, like I said, it's going to be a bit short. Also, apologies. I have no idea if there's going to be anything strange about you trying to get this podcast via whatever... Uh, platform you get them on because I use Google's, oh, was it FeedBurner software to aggregate the uh, podcast? And uh, a few weeks ago, it told me, oh, you have to do this thing to associate with an email address and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, whatever. And so I did it. And now it says I have zero subscribers. And I don't know why that is. I think I was up to like three or 3,500 subscribers before, and now I have zero. So for all I know, this podcast is just going to disappear into the great void. Hopefully, everything still works, and it's just some weird bookkeeping error. Uh, but if that is in case, uh, apologies uh, for uh, making it a bit tougher to find this month. Hopefully, though, it'll all just work out in the end. But um, enough about all that business. You're here to hear about games, right? Well, hold on, and we'll be right back. Okay, everybody, time to talk about 15 new games of interest and expansions as well. So, let's start with Streets. Now, this is from designer-artist Hakan Garter. And his previous game, and his first Kickstarter game, I believe, was Villagers. And you know, I did a video for that last month and was very, very impressed by that card drafting game. I thought it just worked beautifully. So I'm immediately interested in whatever Hackon is going to be putting on Kickstarter next. Although he hasn't contacted me about doing a video, but whatever. Uh, so this one is, instead of card drafting, it's tiling, which is one of my favorite mechanisms of all time. And the interesting thing is, it's about gentrification of economic downtrodden neighborhoods. You know, in modern day, this is something you see happening in cities all over the place, where uh, investors and whatnot move in and try to, you know, get new businesses running and, uh, you know, breathe new life into old neighborhoods. Now, I'm wondering if this game will kind of touch on the dark side of gentrification, or if it'll all be sunny and bright and happy. I don't really know. All I do know is Villagers was a very, very good game, so I'm interested to see what Hackon comes up with next at Streets. Then, we've got Crystal Palace. Here's one reason this is on the list. It's the newest game from uh, Feuerland Spiele. And, you know, obviously, these are some of the smartest developers in the industry. They just put out great game after great game. Uh, you know, obviously, people love the, your Terra Mysticas, and you love your Gaia projects and stuff like that. But, hey, last year's Fuji and Magnastorm, I thought were both very, very good titles, the two of theirs that I played. And so, I'm interested in what's next. So, I was inclined to put this on the list anyway, but then I found out it's a dice worker placement game, which is awesome. But here's the deal. You don't roll the dice. You get to set those dice to whatever pip value you want while you're placing them. Although, obviously, the higher, the more whatever, you more actions you get, the more resources you get, but there are downsides as well. So you have to balance that. How strong do you do and give an action? That sounds awesome and very cool and original. A nice little innovation in the dice worker placement up from one of the best publishers in the industry. So Crystal Palace, yes, please. Then... This was hugely surprising to me. The Big Book of Madness, the fifth element. Although they don't say five, they say V. So it's like so it's like the Vith element. I don't know if that's a Roman numeral five or if it's literally the Vith element. But either way, who knew there was more Book of... I mean, when did Book of Madness come out? 
Gosh, it must be like four or five years ago, right? I figured, uh, you know, the sun had set. The, uh, the book had closed on the Big Book of Madness. Yeah, the original one came out in... Oh, where is it? I'm looking it up now. Very slowly. 2015! Four years ago! So, who knows? There's still some gas in the tank. And that's awesome because Big Book of Madness is a really, really excellent cooperative deck builder. So, new content? Yeah! That, I'm very excited to get it back to the table to check out the Veith element. Then we've got Dice Throne Adventures. And I have to admit, I have zero interest in Dice Throne, which is apparently a very well-received and very highly produced or high-quality production dice dueling game where I've got my cowboy and you've got your cyborg or I've got a wizard, you know, kind of weird mishmash of people who just duel each other using dice. Big, chunky, custom dice. I'm sure it's great, but... Zero interest in dueling. But Dice Throne Adventures takes the gameplay that everybody seems to love and has players teaming up to fight bosses co-op style. So, yes please. I am very, very keen on giving that a go because I'd like to see what the, all the Dice Throne excitement is about. And now I have the opportunity to. So Dice Throne Adventures, very excited. Then there is Ether Fields. Now this is from... Oh, what is his name? Designer uh, Michael... Orshox? Orox? Uh, the, the, the designer behind uh, This War of Mine, and Nurushima Hex, and Theseus the Dark Orbit, a brilliant designer who, over the last few years, has really been working hard on fusing together strong Euro-driven gameplay with, uh, or and, and some American trashy stuff too, but strong gameplay mechanisms with really strong narrative elements. And this seems to be his latest that he's trying to do this in. And this is apparently set in some kind of dream or nightmare uh, landscape where uh, players... I don't know how this works, but players' emotional intelligence will be tested if the description is to be believed. Uh, let's see, it's got some deck building, it's got miniatures, it's uh, got co-op and solo. Uh, all righty. Where was that thing? Oh, yeah. It not only tests your logical skills, but your intuition, deduction, and emotional intelligence. I have no idea what that means. But based on the strength of this war of mine alone, and also Theseus the Dark Orbit, I'm definitely interested in learning more about ether fields. Then we've got Legacies. And now this is interesting because uh, a given session of this game uh, basically covers 300 years. And it is about you as a player trying to develop a legacy for your family. Um, and I don't know how, but I really like that idea of seeing the passage of time, seeing the cards we play update based on the choices we make early in the game and how that plays out at the end. Because uh, there is something in the description about how cards change, how the board changes and stuff like that. So, while this is obviously not a legacy game, if it does something that allows my early choices to affect the uh, later gameplay, which is one of the greatest things about a legacy game, I'm definitely keen on learning more about legacies. Then, here's another big surprise. Lorenzo Il Magnifico, the card game. Who knew this was coming? That's awesome! I mean, because Lorenzo El Magnifico is one of the best, strongest Euros that has come out in recent years. Really, really sharp stuff. Now, that said, I did have some fundamental issues with the way they did player scaling. I mean, I think they really missed the trick so much so that while really the game should be a high 8 on my ranking, it should have made the top 10 of the year it came out, I do rank it in the, in the high 7s because I so vehemently disagree with the player scaling, which is so easy to fix. I play with my own home variant, um, which I hate having to do. But all that aside, I'm hoping Lorenzo Il Magnifico, the card game, doesn't suffer the same fate. But I'm definitely keen on trying it out because the original was so, so smart. Then another expansion. Merlin, Knights of the Round Table, who I'm sure dance wherever they're able. And, um, sorry, uh, that was a Monty Python reference for people who don't know why I said that. Uh, this is the latest expansion. And the previous one, Arthur, was very, very good. My only complaint is it makes the game longer. And again, there was an easy way to fix that. I don't know why Renick and Fell implemented it the way they did. There was, but anyway, sorry, that's beside the point. Arthur was great, other than the fact that it makes the game too long. I expect, therefore, Knights of the Round Table, which I already backed on Kickstarter. I think the Kickstarter might already be over now. But I suspect this will also greatly enhance the game, because every time you play, you get to choose, as part of setup, two of the 12 Knights of the Round Table, which give you unique starting powers, player powers. Yeah! Love bringing player powers into game. And so I expect this is going to be really, really good stuff, too. Just hopefully it doesn't make the game even longer still. Uh, that was Merlin, Knights of the Round Table. 
Then we've got Natsumeno, which I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is a, I'm assuming a Japanese game. And uh, I worry that this won't work very well with two. But I'm keen to try it anyway, because apparently this is a game where we are kids. I don't know if we're high school aged or middle school aged, probably middle school aged. And apparently the game is all about us having, trying to have the best summer possible, doing all kinds of activities, getting ready for the next school year, playing with other kids, going on vacation, stuff like that. But the interesting thing is these activities, if you and I both engage at them at the same time, even though we are opponents in this game, our, the characters we play become fast friends. And then there's this kind of element of cooperation between us. That sounds awesome. That sounds so thematically lovely. I so want to see how that works out. But like I said, I worry it won't work out that well with only two players, where zero sum rears its ugly head. So maybe it's not going to be that good, but I love the idea of uh, Natsumeno. Or Natsum Natsum Natsumemo. There we go. Check the show notes to see how it's spelled. Anyway, after that, we've got On the Underground London slash Berlin. And now this is a new repent upgraded edition of a classic rail route building game on the underground. And the reason, I mean, <clears throat> I've never really been that keen on seeking on the underground out. I, I know what it is. Uh, you know, a lot of people say it's like the thinking man's ticket to ride because it's the same kind of, oh, you're laying down rails and whatnot, but there's a lot more depth and complexity and richness, but it's still kind of an abstracted game about trying to lay rail better than your opponents to uh, create the best commuter routes to score the most points. Like I said, it's a huge pop game. I think it came out in 2006. Here's the reason it's on this list, because I think it's going on Kickstarter. Well, I know it's going on Kickstarter, because I'm going to be doing a paid preview for it soon, so I'll be able to tell you more about it then. The reason I'm interested in On the Underground is because for years now, for easily over a decade, Tom Vassell of the Dice Tower has been raving about this game. The number of times he has put it in top 10 lists, the number of times it has made his top 100 games of all time, it's, 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 it's got to be, it's one of his favorite games of all time, and he's been you know, singing his praises for years, it has been out of print forever, and so now it's finally coming back with a complete graphic overhaul, which I know some fans of the original game uh, won't absolutely like, because it, it gets much more artistic, but I've seen it, and I think it looks gorgeous, but, you know, hey, art is subjective, taste may vary, but anyway, that aside, more importantly, it has the original London map that the original game came with, but it also has, on the flip side, a Berlin map that creates or creates new ways to score that adds new depth to the game. So that's very, very cool too. So basically, I'm keen on trying this out to find out what Tom, Va Tom Vassell has been raving about for over a decade now uh, on the underground. After that, we have got Pandemic Rapid Response, which I'm sure everybody's already heard about now uh, since it was a surprise announcement a few weeks ago. And it seems like every reviewer in the universe, except for me, got a copy for whatever reason. But... It's still coming out. I've been assured a copy is coming my way, so I'm planning on covering it for you this month. However, I did already get to play it because uh, they had three copies of it at Dice Tower Spring. Uh, in in uh, May, which Jen and I went to. So I got to play it several times. It's from Kane Klenko. It is his next game after Fuse and Flatline of him experimenting with real-time dice rolling games set now in the Pandemic universe. And I'll just tell you right now, folks, spoiler alert, it's great. It's not as good as Fuse. Fuse is still his real-time dice-rolling masterpiece. It might surplant... It's definitely in the same range in terms of quality as Flatline, but I think I need to play it a little bit more. I need to play it with Jen, really, to be able to determine where it ranks. But long story short, regardless, it's great. It's really fun. I'm looking forward to playing a bit more of Pandemic Rapid Response. Then, hey, let's go back to uh, Foreland Spiele again, because they've also recently announced a new expansion for Terra Mystica, Merchants of the Seas. And now I'll be honest. At this point, I have zero interest in playing Terra Mystica because while it's a brilliant design, it had a terrible two-player implementation of its area control, and just about everything about it was just ill-conceived for two-player gaming. And I think I'm not alone in that. I don't think that's a particularly um, controversial statement for me to make. And then, on top of that, its sequel, the science fiction-themed... Um, Gaia Project, which is basically taking Terra Comiska into space, fixed all that and was a great two-player game. So I don't think I would ever play Terra Mystica over Gaia Project. But wait, 
I love fantasy more than sci-fi. And Merchants of the Seas? I don't know much about the particular gameplay it adds. Apparently merchants, apparently ships. But it supposedly, from people who have played it, greatly improves the two-player gameplay. And based on how good the two-player was in Gaia Project, now I'm interested. Now you've got my attention for Terra Mystica Merchants of the Seas. And then after this, oh, I should have tried to figure out how to pronounce this ahead of time. Tris, Trismegistus. Trismegistus. I'm sure that's entirely wrong, uh, but it's Trismegistus, the ultimate formula. And this is a dice drafting game uh, about making potions because we're wizards. You see a lot of games like that. What does this do to stand out from the crowd? Well, its designer is Daniele Taschini, who is the co-designer of Zolk in the Mind Calendar, Teotihuacan, Marco Polo, Tale of Pirates. I mean, this guy um, is on a tear. So anything his name is on uh, is, I'm relatively certain, going to be high quality. So even if I am a little bit burned out on the whole making potions once again, I'm definitely interested in um, uh, Trismegistrius, the ultimate formula. I'm just going to call it the ultimate formula from now on. I think. Okay. Moving right along, next to the last game, Edo Deluxe Edition. And I'm so happy about this because Edo came out years ago within a few months of Lords of Waterdeep. And Lords of Waterdeep, if you were in the game industry at the time, you know how big a splash that game made. It was huge. And it's still a very, very well-loved game to this day. And unfortunately, because it beat Yido to market, because the game shared a lot of similarities in its kind of narrative story-driven worker placement style, Yido kind of got forgotten. And that's too bad because, in a lot of ways, Yido was the superior game. It was certainly Lords of Waterdeep for gamers. If you like the idea of Lords of Waterdeep but thought it was too lightweight and gateway, because it is definitely a gateway game, Yido was not. It had a lot more stuff going on. But it's been forgotten because of a fluke of bad timing. Um, but now, it's getting a deluxe edition. It's coming back, and hopefully it'll get a chance to shine on its own, because it was a very worthy game, as I recall. So, Yido the Deluxe Edition, coming soon. And then the last one on my list this month, uh, from designer Frank West, who, a couple years ago, gave a City of Kings, which was an excellent fantasy co-op Euro-style adventure game. And then last year, what was it? Um, Gardens of Vidoran Gardens, which was also a very fun little tiling or card-laying uh, garden walking simulation. That was very good, too. So Frank has got two excellent games out, and so he's bringing us his third, The Isle of Cats. And I have to admit, I'm not a particular cat lover. I could take him or leave him, but uh, I'm definitely interested in these cats because the designer pedigree is phenomenal, and this is a polyomino game where we're trying to rescue cats from an island that is in danger, and we have to put them on our ship, and the cats come in Tetris piece shapes. And they're really cute. I've seen the art for it, because I'm going to be covering it when it goes on Kickstarter. It looks gorgeous. I suspect the gameplay will be great, although I haven't played it yet. But Frank West, he is on a tear. So definitely keep your eyes out if you're a Kickstarter backer or if you're interested in polyomino, Tetris-y style puzzle tile lane games for the Isle of Cats. And that's it, folks. The new games of interest. And if you hold on, I'll be bringing Jen in for the Q&A. Because like I said, this is going to be a short episode. So hang on. We'll be right back. Okay, everybody, time for the questions and answers. And like I said, this is the shortest podcast ever. We're here already. And there are precious few questions, but Jen and I will do our best to get through them to answer your cues with A's. Of course, as always, we'll start with some gaming-related stuff. And then after all the gaming stuff is out of the way, the personal stuff will start, at which point half of you will tune out because... We're not people to you. We're just gaming machines. <laughs> and that's okay. We have accepted our lot in life. So, let's get going. Honey Pie, are you ready? I am ready. For the first question from Thomas, who, of course, has several questions. And although he would like to say that he hopes uh, Jen, my mom, and me are doing well. Oh, that's very kind. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Thomas. Okay. Question number one. What part of the gaming process do we enjoy the most and why? I think this is more towards me. Anticipating the game that has already come out by reading about it on BGG or by reading the rules, playing the game, or thinking back about the game and the experience it provided. 
Um, of course, you have no anticipation because everything's a surprise and a wonderment to you. Occasionally, somebody you tell me that it's gonna we're gonna have another expansion or whatever, but mm -hmm. um, I, but there aren't very many games that I would care to um, anticipate. I guess I just don't have that much brain space. There's a lot of games coming out, but so I guess for me, it's playing the game. Yep. Easy peasy answer. You don't think back on your experiences. Uh, no, not really. Yep. I think once I'm done playing the game, I'm done. You're like a shark. Yep. Always swimming forward or else you'll drown. <laughs> Something like that. All right. Although I do look back on, say, that time in uh, France when we were playing Pandemic for the first time. I mm -hmm. look back on that with great enjoyment. So I but guess just I that, do. Just that one, though. No, there's lots of other games I look back with enjoyment on. Ah, but it's still not your favorite thing. The favorite, the best is playing. Yeah. Oh, I'd have to agree with that. I have to admit, I mean, I'm not that big into anticipating games. Uh, because, I don't know, if anything, I'm dreading new games. Because that means we get more games. <laughs> more games. We'll never go back and play these games again. You are the only person in the world that complains about that. Uh, I imagine other board game reviewers might share that uh, feeling a little bit, perhaps. But most of them probably don't have as much turnaround as me. I mean, heck, who actually films more than me? Tom Vassell. And I think that's it. I'm, I'm probably easily number two in terms of number of games, individual titles that I cover in a given year. Well, you you just told me you did like 2,000 videos so far in your career, right? Uh, I'm not sure. Something like that. 1,500 to 2,000, something yeah. like that. I mean, not all of those are games. Or not ones, videos. But... More, lots more videos than that. Oh, but those that are just that's reviews? individual games. <gasps> that's the number of games. No that wonder you I and can't I... remember them all. <laughs> I just want everybody to know 2,000 games is not my brain. It's probably problem. closer to 1,500. Okay. Still. But still, that's a lot. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, I, uh, there's a brief moment of anticipation when I first hear about a game, but then it's pretty much, eh, whatever. Uh, yeah, and playing the game. I I don't really think... No, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really dwell on what we previously played. Maybe that's just a function of the fact that I'm constantly having to get ready for the next one, though. All righty. There are some games, though, that you anticipate. Then those are the ones you tell me about. Like I when the next Legacy game is coming out, or Pandemic's got a new something. I suppose. But in mo mostly, I just tell you when I hear about it, and then I stop thinking about it. Really. Number two, for a game that, you said, has too much take that, Res Arcana, or is it Res Arcana? I don't know my Latin. Is ranked fairly high on my list. Number 42, as of the writing of this email. Does that mean you found a way to remove, bypass the elements you don't like about the game? Or is it just that the core game is just too good? It is the latter. Um, I am still on the fence about that game. It is so brilliant. It is so good. It is easily Tom Lehman's best design. And that's saying something because the man has designed some of the best modern designer board games out there. And yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm still not happy about it. And I'm still not sure if I'm going to get rid of the game. So that number 42 ranking, give or take, I'm not sure where it is at the moment, is is based on just how much both Jen and I really, really respected and admired it. And we were both like, ah, the take that. Does this break the rule? Do we have to keep it anyway? I mean, there's no reason to because it's not like even if we do keep it, we'll ever play it unless he brings out an expansion. And then, oh, we have the expansion. Okay, that gives us the opportunity and the excuse to play it again for a little bit. But yeah, it is it is a reflection of its quality that maybe if Rado runs through to be retired next week, it would be a keeper because we'd go back and play it again in spite of the fact that it has a fair amount of... Well, it, it's not really... It doesn't have that much take that in it because really, I mean, this is an important element. As often as not, even if you have a card that you can attack with, that is not the best, most powerful move for you to make. Um, you know, it is... You know, I mean, attacking that game can be a trap. It can be quicksand that slows you down more than it slows down your opponent if they're just continuing to move forward while you're just trying to put roadblocks in their way. So that's something to bear in mind as well. It's more that there is the ever-present threat of violence between players in the game that's just kind of a bummer, and I wish it wasn't there, but it is pretty important and woven in. Alrighty, number three. What are the three words that most define what I liked and didn't like in gaming in the last year? <sighs> Honey pie. M mentally tabulate all the games you played for the last 365 days and come up with three words that sum it up. That's, uh, I can't even do that. Mm. To the list of the games we played over the last 365 days. 
and come up with three words. All right, to do that, I will just go to Board Game Geek and I will look at the big geek list. That's of all the games. And let's see. D D D. Or you know what? Actually, maybe, yeah, because there's a couple hundred games I'd have to think about to try and sum up a couple hundred games in, the, in three words. Uh, I, uh, w honey, what would be the three words you just sum up last year? Oh my, chaos, <laughs> um, stress, mm -hmm. and new beginnings. I chaos, guess. stress, and new beginnings. Yeah. All right, there we go. That, of course, because we had an epically long... How many months were we moving? How many months were we effectively homeless? Six months. Six months. Well, no, eight months, because we moved in here in August. And we left Although, in March. Oh, yeah, but we were packing and stuff. I think that certainly disrupts everything. Yeah, last year was a crazy year. Uh, all righty. Um, but, let's see. If I were to think about the top ten games <laughs> of last year... Oh, yeah, there were some feld, there was some feldiness, that was nice, and, yeah, dude, sorry, I'm sorry, Thomas, that's hard, that's way too hard, <laughs> um, yeah, you tell I'll try, uh, your three, three words, yeah, yeah, I didn't hear you suggesting your three words, you come back with your three words to give me something to springboard off of, and then we'll revisit your, your very tough question, Thomas, um, but then, number four, I think you did a bit about, um, um, uh, about, Rise of Queensdale in an updated version of the top 10 of 2016. But would my rating of the game, or what, what rating would I give the game? Uh, it's a solid eight. As for where it goes in the pantheon of games, I don't know. Hold on a second. Let me just pull up a, let's go to ranked.rado.com, ranked.rado.com, and I will rate it for you right now. Because uh, once the page comes up, I will just go to kind of a random spot in the middle of the eights, because I know it's an eight. And let's see, here I am at Chimera Station, which is an 8.343. Is it better or worse than Chimera Station? Better. Sentient, better. Valparaiso, better. Nations the Dice Game. Ugh. Uh, after that, Jaipur and Akrotiri, no. Okay, so... It is between Valparaiso and Nations the Dice Game, which means it is an 8.3446. That is my rating. <laughs> and I should, that, that is Nations the Dice Game, which includes the expansion. Nations the Dice Game would be uh, high 7, low 8 without the expansion content. Uh, but with Nations the Dice Game, the expansion, uh, Queensdale just comes in a little bit lower for the reasons I talked about. So... That was half of it, because, and you also said, do you think you would have, if we would have played it in our new home with a room dedicated to gaming, if we would have enjoyed it more? We enjoyed it. You remember this game, honey, right? It was in the middle of all the chaos you were previously discussing, <laughs> when we were stress. temporarily laid over in England for a few months. Oh. It was the legacy game we played, and we had, we had to play it like 10 or 12 times. It was the dice rolling game where we put stickers on the dice. Oh, yeah. 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 Yep. I liked it. Yeah, yeah, it was a good game. We both enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and I don't think, yeah, I don't think our circumstances or situation really had any kind of impact on my final rating of the game. My final rating of the game comes from the fact that regardless of where or when in our lives we played it, unlike Pandemic Legacy or Charterstone, mm. it does not have a post game. There's no reason to keep playing it once it's done. So that knocks it down a bit. And also, all of the cool little mini games that pop. I remember there was like the the Rochambeau game, and there, there were like lots of just little... Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, that was a spoiler, folks. There's a Rochambeau game in there. Um, well, no, it wasn't Rochambeau. So I didn't spoil it. But there was a Rochambeau-esque thing. <laughs> um, there was a... You know, that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They were all terrible for two players. They all. It's like the designers just, okay, we're going to throw these things in. They're all really cool, and they're terrible unless you're playing this game with four players. They're, they're kind of pointless. And, and so, the, I mean, those are the things that brought the rating down. The core gameplay was very, very good. The dice worker placement stuff. Oh, and then the other thing that brings it down was that, as you, you remember, as we kept building up our little thing, however many times we played it, 10, 12, 14 times, you know, the more you stickered stuff up, the more you put your unique things in, yeah. the, the game, you were on rails. You yeah. pretty much, you were a crazy explorer girl. Yep. Every game we played, it was just about you exploring as fast as you could. You never really got to experience anything else because you kind of set yourself I, on that yeah, road. Yeah, I set my die up that way. And uh, and it and and you know, 
unlike Charterstone, which I think is brilliant because while, yes, my little neck of the woods that I'm building over time kind of tends towards a certain thing based on how I build it up, but every time I play, uh, the game encourages me to take new uh, special characters because you get more bonus points if you keep using new ones instead of using the same one over and over again. Yep. And so, oh, well, this special character, I'm probably never going to visit my own neck of the woods. I'm always going to go to the other one over there. So, I mean, those are the things that kept it down, not our circumstances under which we played it. But it was still really great. We really enjoyed it. Heck, it was an 8.3447, <laughs> or whatever I just said it was. <laughs> All righty. Lucas says he has some questions regarding uh, the making of the show. How often do we play games before our run-throughs? Uh, usually two times, sometimes once, sometimes, in the case of a legacy game, 10 or 12 times. But on average, a couple of times. Plus the run-through itself. I count as a experience the game because, hey, I'm still experiencing as I go. So generally two and a half times. Uh, during these plays, I guess you already think of what you would say in the final thoughts, don't you? Yes. I'm uh, Every second I'm playing a game, I'm evaluating it based on how it rates compared to other games and, and all the rest of it. That's my job. How much... And you're not, are you? You're just enjoying it? I'm just playing it. Yep. Uh, which is one of the reasons I then query Jen like crazy and drill down after we're done playing. Mm. Okay, what did you think? Because you didn't actually think about what you think while you were playing it. <laughs> Only now will you think about what you think about it. <laughs> so it gives a different perspective, which mm. is always helpful for me. How much do you discuss these things with Jen during the game and afterwards? Very little during... Uh, I think Unless often there's something really obvious, and then we'll stop and talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there's if there's a clear problem, or often if it's like, oh my god, this is amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, occasionally you'll hear us say that when it's like a really, really good game. Yeah, this is fantastic, uh, but we won't really dig into anything deep during. But afterwards, like I said, I, I, we spend at least a few minutes, if not more, uh, with me querying her because I've already, I already have in my head, what I think about the game, cataloged against the, whatever we just said earlier, 2,000 games I previously <laughs> played. But, uh, you know, Jen has to think and kind of work through, and I kind of, well, you know, but I'm thinking about this, and I actually start, even to her, articulating what I'm ultimately going to say in a video. Uh, all right. How much of, how much do you think Jen's thoughts of a game influence yours? Oh, I think very influential. Like I said, she has a completely different perspective because she's not, I mean, she views every game in a bubble. She very rarely draws comparison between games. So, I mean, that's a very different perspective that I have a hard time um, achieving, um, which, which I think is good. It's actually a problem I think all board game reviewers have because it's like a really common complaint I see board gamers if they uh, are negative about a game that doesn't, quote, reinvent the wheel, that doesn't have some really cool new innovation. Often, gameplay reviewers are, well, you know, I've seen all these mechanisms before. Yes, perhaps they're put in a new combination here, but meh, I've said there's nothing new here pass and it's like that doesn't mean the game is bad at all that just means you're burned out because you've played too many games uh and like i said so it's really good that jen kind of reminds me that well no who cares if this is a combination of things i've seen done in other games how is it here so yeah i mean jen's very uh very helpful and uh you know helping me form my final and, and plus you know my my final thoughts reflect her responses as well too i try to articulate if she had any strong feelings as well uh, I don't always say, oh, and by the way, Jen thought this. I I just kind of incorporate her perspective into my own that I communicate. Not that you should pay attention to our final thoughts at all. Watch the run through and decide for yourself. Do you take notes on the aspects you want to mention in the final thoughts? No, and I really, really should. I will be honest. The number of times I've finished filming a final thoughts, like, oh, I forgot to say this. Because then I'm like, oh, now i got to record the whole dang thing all over again. Or even worse, I could record a little insert and then I got to edit. Ah! <laughs> so often there will be one or two things that I just forgot to mention. I'll, I'll be honest. And then, you know, sometimes on YouTube, because that's where most of the co conversation happens. It's weird. It used to be back in the day, most of the conversation, most of the replies, most of the back and forth on my videos happened on Board Game Geek. But nowadays that doesn't happen at all. Board Game Geek's gone completely silent. There's hardly ever any back and forth. But there's always back and forth on YouTube. And often somebody will say, well, what, what do you think about this? And I'm like, ah, yes, I forgot to mention. I was totally going to say that too. So um, if you read the comments on YouTube, you'll get the whole picture, I guess, in some cases. Yes, I should take notes. I should be more prepared, but I'm just too slapdash. How much do you think about what you like about a game between filming it 
between playing it and filming the run-through? Um, in some cases, maybe I, I dwell on things a bit more or do some research and say, wait a minute, there was this other game. I should go back and take a look at that. Go back and look at an old video I did. But that's kind of the exception to the rule. You know, after we played the thing, I'm ready to go. You know, um, so yeah, not, that's kind of, like I said, that's an exception to the rule. Thanks for the questions, Lucas. Moving right along to Pear, who uh, says, uh, they, uh, Pear thinks that I have alluded to it, but have I considered a Rado Revisits series? Yes, Pear, I have. If you do a search, a Google search, for Rado Year 8, you will find a post I made where I talk about, hey, here's the new stuff I'm planning to do for Year 8, and one of them is a new series called Rado Revisits, where every month I will revisit something. Most of the time, it's probably going to be a top 10, but sometimes it might be a, uh, a classic game, as you suggest. I didn't read the rest of your thing. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think probably the first game I'll revisit is Tracarian because... As I understand it, the game changed significantly between the prototype I covered, in a large part because of the feedback I gave in my final thoughts, and they addressed a lot of it for the two-player game and whatnot. So that's definitely a game I need to revisit. It's on my short list of things to do. So that is coming in the future. I already did my first revisit last month, because it's the revisit I've always done, which is going back and uh, checking out my top ten to, of, of the previous year to see if anything has changed. Anyway, next up, you describe yourself as a Care Bear. And some games, like Alien Frontiers or Seven Wonders Duel, for example, are too mean for us. Totes respect the opinion. You didn't say totes, but I tr uh, truncated it. But in your run-throughs, you seem to be pretty cutthroat while often getting in your opponent's way. Would you like to explain this paradox in more detail? Uh, honestly, I, when I'm filming a run-through of a game that I think is too cutthroat, I am trying to demonstrate in the run-through why I think it's too cutthroat. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm perfectly capable of being a cutthroat player. I'm perfectly capable of identifying moves that I could make that will cut you off at the knees and why I should really do it, and I just don't want to do it. But in a run-through, I'm not playing against a human player. I'm just trying to demonstrate to you, the audience, this is the experience you are going to get. Which, again, is why my final thoughts shouldn't matter at all. I'm trying to demonstrate all the features of the game. And, that, and if a game is cutthroat, I've got to demonstrate that. Even if it's not my preferred mode of play. Okie doke. Ironically, on the flip side, a few years ago when I did that Dice Tower Marathon and we played Carson City, that was an odd thing because I was at a table full of sharks who were ready to root and toot and steal from each other every step of the way. And I set out to say, okay, well, I could play that way, but I'm going to be a peacenik. I'm going to just completely 100% not attack anybody and just try to protect myself and turtle down. And even though Jason Levine keeps attacking me and stealing from me every single round, I'm just going to uh, turn the other cheek, as it were. And uh, I didn't win, but I tied for third. It was actually, if I recall correctly, a three-way tie for third. There was first, second, and uh, and uh, which were very close. And then, uh, so I did okay. Um, but anyway, sorry, that's neither here nor there. Errol says... Do how do I define an engine builder in my video of top ten engine builders, or, or no, in his video of top ten engine builders, Jamie Stegmeyer defined it uh, and gives a reason as to why Scythe, Errol's favorite game, is one hundred percent engine builder. While I find it hard to argue with the creator of his favorite game, uh, <laughs> he will argue uh, the definition <laughs> of an engine builder. Errol would argue the an engine builder not only needs to have an engine building as the main mechanism, but needs to have a chaining effect, where activating one thing activates another and so on, just by turning on an engine, uh, just by turning on an engine, activates the alternator, uh, which ultimately leads to the radiator fan and so on. The, uh, the engine must uh, runs multiple mechanisms in the vehicle, all connected via the serpentine belt. That is an engine. Would that not be a more correct definition of engine building? Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, let's see here. Let's, uh, Errol, look up the actual definition of the word engine, shall we? Because I'm not, I know, I, I instinctually know what it is, but let's, let's get, if you want to get technical, let's get technical. Engine. No, not engineer. Google, I said engine. All righty. All right, engine definition. Definition. A machine with moving parts that converts power into motion. That is the definition of an engine. It doesn't say anything about interconnected parts there, does it, Errol? Oh my, Errol. I think 
while I have no problem with your definition of, of an engine building game, um, a, an engine is a machine with moving parts that converts power into motion. Now that is interesting. What is a machine? Uh, definition, machine. A machine is an apparatus using or applying mechanical power and having several parts, uh, each with a definite function that together performs a particular task. Hmm. So, okay, here's the... Pro okay, well, uh, strictly speaking, there is no such thing as an engine builder because board games do not convert power into motion. So we will just have to skip that aside. We'll have to talk about virtual power into virtual motion. The virtual motion being victory points, the virtual power being resources. So we'll have to abstract that. But the interesting thing is, every time I, for myself, when I say this is a great engine builder, I think I'm saying this is a great machine builder. Um, because, I mean, that's kind of my personal definition. I create a physical thing, or you know, an abstracted virtual physical thing, whether it's a, co a collection of cards or whatever, that via some mechanism in the game, I can press go, and that virtual machine will create something. <sighs> Although, strictly speaking, for it to be an engine, it has to take something in and then spit something out. It has to take power and convert it into motion, or it has to take resources and convert it into energy. I don't think I can include that in my definition of an engine builder. To me, it's just, hey, I've got this little jalopy, I've got this contraption, I can make it go, and it spits out stuff. Which is, to me, why a deck builder is an engine builder. My engine is my deck of cards. I don't put anything into... Well, I mean, as I build, I put stuff in. But generally speaking, um, on a given turn, I, I just draw cards, and that's me running my engine. But it's not. That's a machine. I'm running a machine. So, I will have to cop to the fact that my definition of an engine builder is really a machine builder, but nobody calls them machine builders, so I'm going to keep calling them engine builders. I have no idea. You did not articulate what Jamie's definition of an engine builder was, so I can't say to that. I am perfectly fine with you wanting to, to more narrowly constrict the definition of an engine builder. And I have to say, having never played Scythe, I'm not really quite sure why Scythe would be an engine builder. I, I, I'm just not familiar enough with it. It would have been great if you would have included in here. I mean, you include the link, but I'm not going to watch Jamie's video right now um, where he says Scythe is an engine builder. I'm, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I've been in... I mean, heck, I'm reminded of my... Uh, five years ago when I did my top 10 worker placement game, and oh, I got so much crap because of the definition of worker placement. There were so many people who demanded that worker placement must be defined as I place a worker on the board and no one else can occupy that space. That player blockage was essential. And if there is no player blockage, either because, oh, I put my workers on my own board, or it's a game where I can put workers out and other players can go to the same space. That's not uncommon at all. Therefore, it's not worker placement, it's action selection. And it's like, okay, well, first of all, action selection as a gameplay mechanism is a meaningless term. You might as well say oxygen breathing game, because we always breathe whenever we're playing a game. You always select actions when you're playing a game. And so I, I, I don't understand that argument. And, but I also didn't understand the need to try to narrow a definition down to its tightest, most precise term. I don't know that that necessarily helps in any kind of lingual way with the communication of ideas about board games. I like broader, more inclusive terms. I like worker placement to be just about, hey, yeah, I have a worker. If I place it, it's a worker placement game. Um, as opposed to, nope. That is only the first round of hurdles a game must overcome to be crowned worker placement. And it seems like, and I, from what you've wrote in here, I think you're doing the same thing. You're saying, well, you can recognize why Jamie would call an engine builder what he calls it, or why I would, but you think that's not good enough. You have to narrow it down and squeeze it into a little box. Now, I appreciate there is a counter-argument that, oh, if we're too broad and wide, the phrase becomes meaningless. But I think you would agree, even with whatever Jamie's definition of engine builder is, broad and wide as it is, it allows the inclusion of scythe, it's still a more useful definition than action selection, the most meaningless gameplay mechanism you can choose in board game geekdom. So, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I, 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 have nothing, I have no problem with yours, but you know there are no official rules. There's just zeitgeist definition, which is why people who argue that worker placement must include player blockage, they lose. Um, you know, the rest of the board game geek hive mind has already moved on and expanded the definition of worker placement. 
Uh, I don't know that there is. I mean, it's interesting. There is no definition on Board Game Geek of Engine Builder because you cannot sort by Engine Builder. That is not listed as a mechanism. And it's because it's not really a mechanism. It's an action. It's it's a task that you try to do. You try... I mean, it's if anything, it's a genre. It's not a mechanism. The same way co-op. Cooperative play is not a mechanism. It is a genre. So, anyway, sorry, long story short, hopefully that is some food for thought, Errol. Uh, I feel like I was all over the place with that. But now we're going to move on to Stacy, who says, Rodney did a video, and now that I've started doing paid reviews and previews, do I have thoughts? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, uh, for those who don't know, Rodney Smith of Watch It Played, uh, a month ago or so, I guess, several weeks ago anyway, put up a video where he tried to do a deep dive into the controversy around board game reviewers accepting cash in exchange for content cash. from publishers. And of course, Stacy points out, I now do that. Although I would like to point out, I think I am the only reviewer who does it who not only ticks a little button that says paid promotion, but I also verbally, out loud, in every single video say, don't forget, I got paid for this video to remind everybody that I'm a corporate chill and I shouldn't be trusted because I'm on the take and I'm corrupt through and through. Whee! Or at least that's what some people assume. <laughs> a, a small minority. Anyway. So, because there is a small and vocal minority of people who have appointed themselves the online vigilante watchdogs of fair and balanced journalism in the board game industry, Rodney decided to try to touch on the subject. And, long story short, the thesis of his video, although I don't know that he necessarily presented it the right way, um, because I think a lot of people could totally miss it, is... Well, yeah, maybe there is a little bit something hanky about um, reviewers, like myself, taking money from publishers, but what's worse is reviewers doing it for free, because that's kind of ridiculous to expect uh, someone to create a useful service for you and for them to get nothing in return. Uh, and that just doesn't make sense. That just flies in the face of capitalism. So, if we're not supposed to do it with, if we're not supposed to take uh, preview fees, uh, you know, thereby turning their videos into effective commercials, what should they do? What's the counter argument? And that's what Rodney just left the door open and asked questions. And it seems like the majority response is, well, that's what YouTube's ads are for. And you know what? YouTube's ads and uh, two quarters will get you a cup of coffee. Maybe, if you're lucky, but certainly not at Starbucks. YouTube, yeah, YouTube money is nothing. Until you have half a million subscribers, or you know, until you're getting 100,000 views per video, it's immaterial. It is drop in the Bucketsville. I can confirm this because I have turned on ads a year ago. I'm not, and that's not fair. It's not nothing. It's certainly appreciated, but it is nowhere near remotely compensating for the amount of work and blood, sweat, and tears that goes into this career. So that's not good enough because the board game industry as a whole isn't big enough. If I were doing video game uh, run-throughs, I am sure... I, well, I, I can't be. That's a bit presumptuous of me, but I would assume I would be doing fairly well with that and I could survive just based off ad revenue like, uh, like Angry Joe or something like that. Or certainly probably not PewDiePie. Uh, he was in the right place at the right time, but something similar. But I'm not doing that. I'm doing board games, and that means there will never be any sizable money for YouTube ads. So then everybody says, well, it has to be Patreon or Kickstarter. And you know what? For a small group of lucky few, and I include myself in that, uh, that's, a, that's a viable option. For the vast majority of people who are working just as hard as me, and hey, in some cases, producing better content than me, um, they, that will be even less of a drop in the bucket, or at best, the same drop in the bucket. So there's no viable um, option there either, really. And th Rodney didn't come out and say this, but I'm, he's going to do a follow-up, and I bet this is what he's going to say. Although, who knows? I can't speak for the man. He's going to say, that's why you know publisher sponsorship is the only viable option. And if you disagree, then you do not value the reviewer's time. And you think they should give you something for nothing. And the implication there is, well, that ain't cool of you, is it? So, I guess largely... Well, obviously, based on the moves I've made over the last year. Although, as you know, Stacy, I have 
fought tooth and nail against doing this. Uh, and it's caused me no end of grief. Other reviewers have given me grief over the years by not doing paid previews because I make them look bad. And they um, constantly get thrown in their face. Well, Rado doesn't accept, doesn't do paid previews. So he's good and you're bad. And that's ridiculous. Uh, and, I've, and I've always felt bad that I'm creating grief for other content creators like me because of my stance. And, but I would still be doing it if it weren't for the fact that, hey, you know what? Every time my mom goes to the emergency room for an uh, unexpected GI bleed, mm -hmm. that ends up costing us thousands of dollars now that we live in America. Hooray! So yeah, I have to do it. So that's the reality of it. There's some thoughts. Um, Most of I'm just parsing Rodney's thoughts, and I guess I'm saying I agree with what he implied, but did not actually say. Time will tell if he actually says it or not. Okay. I don't know if you have anything to say about all that, honey pie, while I grab a drink of water, because, oh, I got loud there. You certainly did get loud. Boop! Yes, we're trapped in a little tiny room, <laughs> um, and uh, Jen is bearing the brunt of this. <laughs> yes, and I'm just sort of backing away from the table slowly. But, um, no, I think I think you have struggled with it for eight years, and finally our circumstances are such that you made a economic decision. Mm-hmm. Yep. All righty. Ben says, would I consider the punishing nature of Feld's in Year of the Dragon to be in any way comparable to the Rosenberg shackles of Agricola and other games like it? Oh, totes. Totally. Uh, yeah. The Rosenberg shackles... I have no idea what that means. You've heard me say it before. No, I've it's, never. It's, it's basically, it's when I'm articulating his newer games compared to his older games. Okay. When we play Agricola or Gates of Lo Yang, there are game-created forces that act against us and mean we have to achieve certain goals, ah. and if we don't, we will suffer. Okay. The game puts us in shackles. You didn't, you never have said shackle. In no, it's, I've always, it's the Rosenberg shackles. Okay, if anybody has ever heard us on a podcast talking about shackles, please... Ben, wrong. he said the Rosenberg shackles. He put it in quotes in the email. Well, that's Ben. All right. Anyway. He has said it. All right. Um, and I compare that to his newer games where they're just a lot more easygoing. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're just like, ah, race sheep if you want. If you don't, it's no big deal. It's fine. Do whatever you want. Go fishing. Have fun. Just explore the space. <laughs> And that's fine. It's just, I miss the shackles. I miss the game saying, I will crush you. And and feeling like that's a mountain that I have to climb. It's a hurdle I have to overcome. Um, you know, with, with this more wide open thing, uh, the only hurdle to overcome is Jen. And you know what? I'm never going to overcome that hurdle. I will never feel good about myself if the only metric for how well I did is if I win. Because I always lose. Oh, um, now hold oh. on. Jen tell would them, like to point out. Tell them what we've done in the This last... was a very strange international tabletop day weekend because we played <laughs> five or six new games and I won every single time. Yep. So that was pretty impressive. That is that, that but that you have to admit yourself that that was an outlier. Um, I'm not admitting any such thing. She doesn't have to admit that at all. But anyway, back to your question. Ben, yes. In the Year of the Dragon, it's a it's it's a wonderful example of that. It's a wonderful example. When when I say shackles, what I mean is the game creates um, parameters parameters that you don't have to stick to necessarily, but if you don't, you better have a good reason for it. It gives you focus, it gives you direction, and it gives you challenges and hurdles to overcome. And that's, I think, for both me and Jen, our favorite thing about gaming. Yep. If the game doesn't challenge us, if the only challenge is the other player, we're nowhere near as invested in solving the puzzle of how best to go about maximizing our return on investment, i.e., convert resources into points, which is our favorite thing to do. All righty. Um, ben continues, the barrier to entry for the ITYOTD. <laughs> What's that? Oh, in the Year of the Dragon. Okay, in the Year of the Dragon. is quite a bit lower than the heavier Uwe games. The barrier for entry... Uh, so I'm wondering if it'd be a good gateway game for... Oh, oh, um, oh I see what you mean. Yeah, you, you mean actually the cost, how hard it is to get. Is that true? Yeah, I guess. Oh, that's right, because it got reprinted. Because I was going to say, it's been out of print forever, but it got its 10th anniversary, so I guess maybe it's out there. Uh, In the Year of the Dragon is a phenomenal game. Make no mistake about it. Uh, many people consider it to be Stefan Feld's best. Generally, um, if you ask people what is the greatest Stefan Feld game of all time, 90% of the answers will either be Castles of Burgundy, Trajan, or In the Year of the Dragon. And I think all three of those are viable. I will admit, I rate In the Year of the Dragon a high 7 because... The shackles in that game are perhaps a little too shackling. That game is so... Uh, if you remember it, Honey Pie, it's the one where... 
It's you know, it's it's set in uh, feudal China, and it's a year, the year of the dragon, yeah. and all twelve months are laid out right from the get go, and every month is a terrible, horrible famine, plague, disaster, yeah. and so you can see right from the get go. Here's all the ways the game is going to destroy me every step of the way. And I have to prepare for the one that's about to hit me right now, but also the one that's going to hit me um, in, in, you know, halfway through. And, and, and it's just, it is, it is an insanely harsh game. It has the most harsh ha shackles you can imagine. So I would be honest, I would not say it's a good gateway because I, when I rated a 7, my ratings are not necessarily just about the objective qualities of the gameplay, because it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great game. It's a 9. But it is it can be very demoralizing. If you make one wrong room, one wrong move, it will not forgive you, and it will not let you recover. And that can be, like I said, huge. I've, I've had it. I've been hugely demoralized by that game. So that's why I rated it a little bit lower, but that's why some people rate it so high. But I would warn against it as an early step into a shackly game. I definitely would. Okay, Natalie says, are there games where we feel the need to win is stronger, but maybe not that important? For example, racing games, abstract games, tile layers, games build. Are the games where you feel the need to win is stronger or maybe not that important? Okay, I assume she's trying to contrast and compare because stronger, oh, stronger than normal or less than normal? Um. <laughs> I don't know, Natalie. And I don't understand why you say racing games, abstract games, tile layers, and engine builders are either stronger or not that important. Uh, the need to win. I think the need to win is pretty much a constant. You either feel the need or you don't. <laughs> the need for sure. Jen always says, oh, I don't care if I win or lose until she's losing. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I'm trying to think, why would a, a game that features racing mechanisms require more or less need to win. No, it's, it's, it's a personal, it's a personal goal you set for yourself. So I, I, I'm afraid I don't, maybe I just don't understand the question. You have mentioned in the past that you check your videos and their, and their stats, how many people watch for how long. How does that work? Do you revisit the video stats after it's been mentioned in a top 10 maybe? I for one checked out your video, all three of them for Carpe Diem, uh, after seeing your award season video. Um, right. So you're, do I go, under what circumstances do I revisit my video stats? Actually, I, I have to admit, I don't really do it that often. The main reason I would do so, let's see, why, I, I know I do look at them from time to time. Um, <clears throat> I mean, occasionally, if I see a video's done really well, like, wow, that one's really taken off, I'll go and look at the stat for, oh, since I got ads on, how much money did it make? And it's like, $4, oh. <laughs> Great. That's one of my biggest videos. $4. Wow. Fantastic, YouTube. Thanks. Um, so it, that invariably turns out to be not a particularly interesting stat. Uh, again, you're not going to get rich doing YouTube videos. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't really look at them that much. I mean, there, there was a time when I paid attention. But I, 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 you say I say I look at them, and I guess I do from time to time, but only because of some external stimulus. Because something says somebody says something, and that makes me think, oh, I should go check this because I've got hard data or whatever. So, but I'm not really obsessed with them. Uh, if it weren't for external stimuli, I don't think I'd very, I'd rarely look at stats at all, to be honest. Natalie would like to pick my brain about engine building games. What the? Did you did you team up with Errol? <laughs> All right. Recently started. That's a weird coincidence. Recently started playing a game of terraforming Mars with her husband. Doing really well. Uh, or he was doing well. You have a slow start. Turn structure is that you keep going until everybody passes. Like in mini games, I did two actions. My husband did like ten or fifteen. It was super boring to sit there waiting for him to be done so that I could play again. Right then and there, I felt a strong sense of appreciation uh, for worker placement games where you have three actions to do and um, and you move on. Uh, 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 thoughts? Hmm. Well, I feel your pain, um, Natalie. I don't know how this is. Jen just has some kind of weird sixth sense that whenever she is given a choice between card A or card B, <laughs> She always chooses the card that will, in five minutes' time, lead to insanely complex, intricate chain of event turns. 
I don't think she realizes when she picks them. She just has some innate draw towards the thing that, okay, you could do this one that lets you get five bucks. Or you could do this one that lets you get only one dollar, but under these following circumstances, but it can be compounded via interest uh, payments annually to be able to buy. Ah. That's true. Am I wrong? No, that's true. Can you articulate why that happens? Um, well, I love chains. I've never asked her. I love chains, for starters. I love okay. getting like three or four actions out of one. Mm -hmm. So that would be that. And I also like um, variability. So if it's something that will allow me to choose, you know, this resource or that resource, um, I will always leave my options open. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather have a choice of blue or green versus three bucks. Because she knows the only cost of that is my time. When we get five minutes later and she's in the middle of an epic, what'd you say, 10 to 15 move turn <laughs> while I just sit there and snooze because, okay, I'll play my card and get $5. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> yeah. Am I wrong? No. Is Natalie wrong? Yep. I, I, I feel your pain, Natalie, but you know, I wouldn't deny Jen her fun. And I, I, I imagine you feel the same way. You would not want to deny your husband and yours fun. And, and the best I can do under those circumstances is try to say, wow, that's really cool. I wish I were that smart. But <laughs> that's pretty much where, I, where I'm at with it. Alrighty, Gerald says, Aneta Tonka is having trouble finding a distributor in the U.S. However, when it was on Kickstarter, I don't recall any uh, controversy or controversy, uh, although I don't think Gerald is British, uh, like Manitoba had. What did Neta Tonka do right to avoid such controversy with gamers? Well, one thing it did is uh, it was published by a no-name publisher that nobody, or you know, a not very well-known publisher that nobody's really paying attention to. Whereas Manitoba was published by DLP. And so everybody wanted to know about it because, hey, they could have made another Orleans expansion. They made this instead. I better find out what this is. So obviously Manitoba was predisposed to just draw more eyeballs in the first place. And um, But it's interesting. The two games approached the, t the subject matter of uh, Native American tribal life in very different ways. Or, or uh, no, I shouldn't say that. I mean, th that's what they're both about. But they both approached the complex issue of cultural appropriation in very different ways. And Ma the, problem, the problem with Manitoba is they could not have done a worse job. DLP and Reiner Stockhausen clearly did not give an F. And he went so far as to say, um, I do not care about the thematic consistency of Native American tribes. You know why I don't? Because a lot of American developers mix up French culture and, uh, and get it wrong. And, I, and we, French, we just think it's funny because we're above it all. And um, so we think that, uh, you know, uh, indigenous tribes of Canada should just not be so upset if we said that they have totem poles when in fact, no, that's entirely different that's like a entirely different culture. Um, you know, and it's and why should they be insulted that we said they use totem poles? Because it's all the same, right? We don't get upset if people mix up the names of the Louvre and the Eiffel Tower or whatever. And the problem with that perspective is context. Um, because, well, if you pay attention to the news at all, you know that, hey, just within the last couple of weeks, a uh, government study in Canada released the ongoing, um, uh, modern-day genocide of the indigenous peoples of Canada, you know, with the um, rampant uh, uh, kidnapping and murder of young uh, indigenous girls that is going on to this day because of the systemic uh, racism inherent in the the uh, North American spirit and how it still resonates. And with that as a backdrop to say, who cares if the Cree have totems or not, is so insanely tone deaf compared to the reality of modern day life. And to compare that to, oh, you know what? Sometimes people say there were five musketeers instead of four. How dare they spit on our rich French heritage for something that happened, you know, centuries ago. It is, it was in very poor form. And that is why Manitoba rightly got raked over the coals for a, an obscene level of tone-deaf, gratuitous appropriation. Now, we can turn and pass to uh, Netatonka. The developers knew full well they were going into choppy waters by trying to recreate um, you know, a, a simulation of, of you know, Native American, indigenous people's lifestyles. And so what did they choose to do? Well, there's two ways you can do it. 
arguably the best way, but also the hardest way, is to do a ton of research. Actually hire, um, you know, uh, what do you call it, um, experts in the field to, you know, give you feedback on your gameplay mechanisms to try to be more culturally sensitive and, and all that stuff. You can do that. That's a lot of work. I understand there's no money in board games, so it's understandable if you don't necessarily do that. So what the developers of Netatonka did instead is they uh, said, you know what? This game is not intended to replicate any one, um, uh, you know, uh, tribe. a tribe. It is not trying to tell that story. We this is a fantasy world, effectively, that where we have incorporated elements from different tribes, not just North American tribes, but um, uh, tribes from the uh, uh, the tundras of Siberia and whatnot as well. And we've just kind of put them all. We, we've created a new language. There is no such thing as a Netatanka, and uh, that's what we've chosen to do. And I think that was an interesting way to uh, approach it. A smart way to approach it, because it gave them the opportunity to basically just sidestep everything. And I don't blame them. I would have still rather that they just actually chose, and, uh, chose to take the opportunity to make a game that was more socially and historically aware. But I think it's okay that they chose the other thing. The only misstep they made is they don't come right out and say it. And it's perfectly reasonable for players to think, oh... I'm not quite sure what this tribe is, but I guess it's just some tribe I've never heard about. When in fact, it's a at no point do they say, by the way, this is a fictional tribe that we have created as an amalgamation of different tribes. I think that was a, a bit of a short sight. I believe they talked about that on the Kickstarter page. And because they did that, and because of the fact that, hey, it was a Kickstarter from a, a, of an upstart publisher, they were able to sidestep the controversy that Manitoba just dove headlong into and said, um, yeah, I don't care. Come at me, bro. And, and they did. And it was a terrible, terrible mistake. And a really good game design will be forgotten as a result. Or at least, I don't know. I haven't played it yet. Because I have to admit, I'm a, little, I'm a little leery of the whole thing myself. Alrighty. Moving right along. We have Candace, who says, um, uh, Dice Forge versus R R Roll for the Galaxy. How did these two games come up with a concept? Uh, Candace doesn't say, but I assume she's talking about um, the... The snapping dice, you know, the customizable dice. And do you think a lot of games will do this in the future? Um, hmm. Well, that's a fair question, uh, Candace. But the reality is, neither of them came up with it first. Uh, because LEGO has been doing this for like a decade. Uh, Lego had a series of games where, uh, you know, you, you could do the whole thing. It came with a bunch of different die faces. You can snap them together. If I recall correctly, one of them was designed by Reiner Knizia. One of them was a Star wars theme game. And nobody remembers them because they were all not particularly good kids' games. Because, hey, it's a Lego game. So no, no board game geek cared about it. But as I understand it, they were actually really cool. And uh, so I would suspect it was um, developers at Rio Grande who did Roll for the Galaxy. But hey, before they did that, they did Rattlebones. Um, and hey, probably the French developers who were behind Dice Forge, they probably saw, wow, this thing Lego was doing like a decade ago is really awesome. We should make a real game out of that. So I think that's where it came from. As for will it happen in the future, I don't know. I would love it to because it's awesome. But I suspect we probably won't see a lot of games like it, unfortunately, because I've got to assume the cost involved with manufacturing, um, you know, creating a whole new tool chain in the, in the, you know, once a publisher does do it, I can certainly understand why they'd want to do more. That's Rio Grande. They did Rattlebones. It was kind of a, an okay, well, decently received uh, gateway game. And they said, well, we're going to go back and we're going to put our Race for the Galaxy name on it or Roll for the Galaxy. And um, so of course they did, because once they did all the work, they want to leverage that as much as possible. But yeah, I, I don't think you'd probably see a lot because, well, I, I know nothing about the production of games, but I got to assume it's crazy expensive. Uh, easy for Lego to do because that's all they do. They make modular snap together things, but tougher for others. Alrighty. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I, by the way, I totally skipped over. You might have had something to say about cultural appropriation in board games. No. No. All right, um, Jen pleads the fifth. And with that, folks, like I said, this is a short podcast, is the end of the game-related questions. And if you hold on for a sec, we'll be back with some personal Q's and A's. Also, an even shorter list. Folks, as always, please send questions to questions at rado.com if you want more stuff to listen to on your drive to work or while you're walking the dogs or what have you. But if you're out, then I'll say, as always, thanks for listening. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye. But I suspect you're going to stick around, aren't you? Well, then, we'll be right back right after this.
Okay, everybody, welcome back. Time for one, two, three, four, five emails. Now, I'm sure some of them will have multiple questions, but this is going to be pretty quick, honey. We are going to be in and out. Okay. Which is good for Jen because her mom is showing up at 8 o'clock tonight, so we <laughs> have to get ready for that. Yep. And how long will Emma be staying with us? Uh, two and a half weeks. Two and a half weeks. All righty. So, uh, yeah, we, 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 got, we got to get things in motion. So, let's uh, start off the personal Q's and A's with Ben, who asks, or who states... He's relatively new to my videos and podcasts, and he apologizes in advance if this has already been asked. But what was the process for making an international move with our dogs? Did we have them when we initially left the U.S.? My wife and I uh, have a few more pets uh, and far fewer board games, and we have fantasized about one day moving overseas. I was curious about your experience in general. Throw into the honey pie. Yeah. So it sounds like you live in the U.S. now and you're thinking about going overseas. So the question... He has a Gmail account, so I cannot confirm where he's... But it's a pretty safe bet he's a U.S. I yeah. So, Since 60% of my audience is U.S. There's a stat I looked up recently because somebody asked and I saw, oh, 60% on some particular video was U.S. I'm sorry, honey pie, please continue. Oh, right. Um, so basically, I think you're asking about leaving the U.S. with your pets rather than returning to the U.S. with your pets. But if you want, um, I can do both. Basically, when Tell we, the whole story. we left um, the U.S., we had Dobby, and she was about six years old, five years old, something at the time. So basically, when we decided we wanted to um, move to Europe, which actually was predicated on the fact that we could take Dobby with us and not have to do a uh, quarantine with yes. her when we got to England. When we were in our 20s, we had discussed living in Europe, and at the time when we looked into it... We were, uh, it was, you had to put your dog in quarantine for six months for upon six arrival. six months. Six months they had to live in a cage. And you could go visit them and that was it. Yeah, like and for so, an hour a day. And so we thought, well, we will never live outside of America then. Well, That's we would just bad. have to do it when we're between dogs. I think yeah. it was, anyway. But then cut to 10 years later on my 35th birthday and we start talking again about moving overseas. And this time when we do the research, we discover... Ta-da! They have done this thing because of the um, technology of putting the chips in the dog that you can actually do your quarantine at home. Um, so what you do is basically you get your dog a rabies shot, and then six months later they do something called a titer, which is taking a blood draw to see if your dog has rabies. And as long as your dog doesn't have rabies, then um, and you can be positively IDing the dog because of the chip, the microchip, um, then basically you've done your six months at home, and you can just waltz right into the country and pick up your dog at the airport. It's It does create a little bit of extra complexity for the actual move, because as I recall... This process requires us doing special visits to the vet literally on the day that you fly. Well, right. I think it's within 48 hours, but that's just a standard. When you travel with a dog, you're supposed to get a fit to fly certificate. Oh, so that was immaterial of the quarantine at home? Correct. Oh, I see. Yeah. So Jen has done all this. I've never... Yeah, I mean, it's basically the airlines don't want to take your dog unless they have a veterinarian say that the dog is um, healthy and fit to fly. Speaking of dogs, I can hear Daisy outside barking. So as to not uh, upset our uh, neighbors, neighbors, I'm going to go check that out. I'll just keep talking about uh, moving dogs around. So basically, that's what we did is we just uh, we did that all in advance and everything went about as smoothly as you could possibly imagine an international move doing. the, the one thing that was a little bit hard was that you can't book, or this was again about 15 years ago, so things might have changed, but you, we had a hard time because we didn't know when we were actually going to be moving to England because we were waiting for um, my husband's work permit to get approved from the British government. And so we didn't want to you know fly into England if we didn't have a work permit because it, as it turns out, if you're there to work, you have to actually enter the country with your work permit so that you're in the country legally to work. It ended up that our stuff had left Austin and was on a boat to England, and it, I think, was a 10-week trip or something like that. So we thought, oh, no problem. We'll just take a road trip. We've never been to New Orleans. We hadn't really been on the East Coast much and all that. So we left um, Austin. And took this big long road trip. We spent a lot of time in Corning, New York, which was great for me because it's a sort of a glass mecca place. Um, anyway, and the weeks just kept going and going and going, and the the work permit kept just not coming and not coming and not coming. And finally, our stuff was going to arrive the next was it week or two weeks or something like that. And we fi- we finally just had to fly anyway because our stuff was going to arrive and we were not going to be in the country yet. Right. 
Um, so, and we had no place to live. <laughs> so there was a few minor inconveniences. So anyway, because of not, us not knowing when we were gonna fly, we also couldn't book Dobby onto her flight either. And so it ended up that we actually took separate flights. Dobby was on, I think, Virgin, and we took American or vice versa or something like that. So that was a little bit scary, knowing that, you know, <laughs> hopefully we'd all arrive in the same country at the same time, but it did work out. So, wow. Um, and our stuff arrived, and um, shortly thereafter, we rented a place, and all was well. <laughs> yeah, except for the fact that we had entered the country as guests, and for me to actually start working once my visa eventually did show up, mm -hmm. I had to fly back to America. Yep, you flew uh, with to New like, Jersey. Yeah, uh, with like a two-hour layover, and then got right back on a plane to fly back over. Yeah. And I went directly from the airport to work yeah. for my first day. <laughs> yeah. With literally, uh, after 36 hours of transcontinental flights. It's insane. Yeah. So that wasn't the best. <laughs> no. All right. So I'm sorry. Uh, apparently, is that everything you're supposed to say about dogs? Uh, well, so that was everything about getting dogs to England. Yeah. I guess. Which presumably would be the same for any place that allows you to bring them. That because um, not necess not all countries do. Quarantine uh, issues. Yeah, do, do, will allow, allow you to do the quarantine at home, right? I mean, or well, is it universal? I think actually England is one of the stickiest countries to fly a dog or an animal into because they are an island nation, and so they're very, very worried about rabies. Yeah. I think it's a lot easier to fly into France or Amsterdam or Rome or, you know, any of the other major hubs because they don't have quite as sticky a import process. And, oh my goodness, is it expensive to fly into the U.K.? with a dog or fly out of the UK with a dog. They're really, really high animal welfare um, concerns there. So um, that costs money. Yeah, when we uh, flew back to America with Gertrude and Daisy, they had very strict requirements about the the, you know, the, the crate portable size. crate kennel. It had to be a certain size. And it's a size that you pretty much can't go down to a store and buy. So um, we ended up having crates custom made. Well, the weird thing was that the, the ones that you could buy at a store, at a Petco or whatever, um, were more expensive to ship on the airlines than the custom made plywood ones. And I guess it's because they're not as stackable or they're not as efficient with space oh, usage. Oh, is that what it was? Okay. Or something like that. But it would have cost us an extra couple hundred pounds um, not dollars. Not dollars, but pounds. Not which... that that means much anymore, but... <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so we ended up just, yeah, buying these wood crates and then... Uh, or having them made. Who made them? The the people. The transporters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because the 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 complications uh, now... This was not true when we went over to England 20 years ago. 15. But, or 15 years ago. But now, there is so... It, it is such a Byzantine uh, process to go through that airlines will not work with you. If, if, if you say, right, uh, this is uh, the, you know this is the flight I'm going to be on, and here's all the paperwork, I'm ready for my dog to fly, and we've done the things, and this, that, I've got the passport, and they say, sorry, um, we won't work with you on this. You have to work with one of the third-party agents. agents that have sprung up. There's like this little cottage industry, because uh, we only work with them. Yep. And so, yes, and you're right, the one we chose, they had it, oh, by the way, for an additional fee, we'll actually make a custom-fit box. And those were expensive boxes, so we still have those boxes now. We do, but it was less expensive than using yes. our, our plastic... Well, no, I mean, but... No, I mean, we could have bought those plastic boxes for a lot less than we, we, we when we paid to have these made. Totally. But it would have been more expensive to put the regular kennels on a plane. Yes. Right. It's, so it's, overall, it would have been more expensive for us to use our plastic kennels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got... Which is what made. we had planned to do. We actually yeah. had bought big ones, hadn't we? Well, yes, because we had to get them from Malta anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, then we just left them there, I guess, right? Well, they're in the or attic. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're in the attic. So anyway. it's crazy, but it's worth it. Yep. Uh, it's better it, than it was 25 years ago. Yeah. When we first considered such things. Right. So if you want to know about getting animals to the U.S., if there's Europeans over there who want to do it, uh, send a question for next time, and yeah. I'll go into that because we've gone on quite a lot about dogs. Questions at rado.com. Oh, yeah, and I guess also the pet passport, too. Um, if It's something that you can get now, and it, it has your dog's uh, chip number and all of its vaccination records, and that's just really handy for handing to people if you're traveling with your dog. And yeah. that wasn't around, around 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Okie doke. Nelson asks, if I was forced to turn the Beatles' White Album, which is a double album, into a single album, what songs would I keep? And what songs would I take off? Wow. Do I have to do this from memory, Nelson? Uh, from memory. Uh, definitely keeping back in the USSR. Definitely getting rid of Revolution Number 9. 
Blackbird, I think, is a White Album song. Blackbird Fly. Uh, all right, let's just uh, let's look it up. I'm, I'm I'm not as strong a Beatle file. If you'd asked me this in high school, I would be able to rattle it off the top of my head. But I'm an old. I'm 50. All right, uh, Beatles <laughs> White Album song list. Let's take a looky loo here. All right. Uh, so, like I said, back in the USSR, that's how it opens. Um, I, I could I could do without Rocket Raccoon. Put them all on one page, Google. That's not useful. All right, let's try to go to a different page. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. Yeah, Blackbird. Definitely keeping that. Love Blackbird. Um, hmm. Oh, Oh, Bloody Blah Da. That's one of my favorite Beatles songs of all time. That's so a good definitely. One. Yeah. Uh, I could do without Happiness as Warm Gun. Bang, bang, shoot, shoot. Happiness is warm. Yes, it is. Although now it's in my head. God. All right. That is not a real list either. That was a list of some re thing. That, all right. Can I just get this from the original? Why is this so hard? Okay, Wikipedia. You won't let me down. Wikipedia. Just give me the list, Wikipedia. Oh, Wikipedia. All right, you're making this tough. All right, let's go here. Um, all right, so back in the USSR. I do like Dear Prudence. I'd probably want to keep it. Um, Oladiva Da, definitely. Oh. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm sorry, George Harrison. Probably not my uh, guitar or happiness is a warm gun. I, I love I'm So Tired. That, that song gets stuck in my head a lot to this day. Um, not that I drink at all, but oh, uh, uh, every time I get a little lethargic, that just immediately pops in my head. I love that song. And um, you know, Blackbird, uh, Don't Have a Survive. Oh, um, Why Don't We Do It in the Road. Yeah, that one's fun to sing along to. Uh, I Will is Beautiful. So keeping that one. Oh, everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey. Just so weird uh -huh, and funky. Helter Skelter. I don't know. Jen says no. She refuses. No, nope, we don't want that one. Uh, how about the U2 version then? We're taking it back. No. Um, all right. Apparently, I'm not allowed to keep Helter Skelter. Uh, sexy Sadie, what have you done? Uh, oh, of course. Honey Pie. Honey pie, you're driving <laughs> me crazy. Um, yeah. And, and no, not revolution number nine. That's That was just weird. I mean, it's, it's cool. I've certainly listened to it enough times. I can still just instantly get random snippets stuck in my head. But um, good night. Uh, yeah. Yeah, something like that. That was a crazy question. That was hard. Um, and no Helter Skelter is allowed, apparently. Although I think I would choose it, yes. Kate says... Uh, what were my spoiler-rich thoughts for the Game of Thrones final season? The Long Night, The Bells, Finale. All right, is that four questions? One, two, three, four, or is it just in general? Uh, Kate personally wishes they'd made uh, season seven and eight ten episodes each. I think there would have been far less complaints. However, they think it wrapped up great. I agree, Kate. Wrapped it up great. But in case there's some chances there's somebody out there who has not seen the final season and they don't want spoilers... I'll save it to the end. Uh, I'll come back to you at the end, because there's only two more emails. So we'll come back to you in a second, Kate. Uh, Natalie is back. Honey Pie. Yeah. Um, and by the way, we call each other Honey Pie specifically because of the White Album. Um, do you grow things in your garden? Yes, I do. Eatables, flowers, question mark. Eatables. What do you grow? Did you say eatables or did you say edibles? It looks like eatables, but I assume that's how you spell edibles. I've never even thought of the How word edibles. How is it spelled? She spelled it E A T A B L E S. I can't. Because they're eatables. Eatables. They're eatables. Ah, well, no, it's called edibles, but. But how is it spelled? How is edibles spelled? E D I B L E S. Oh, Natalie. But I mean, I like. Called eatables. out by Jen. I like eatables. In front of an audience of thousands of listeners. No, I mean, it, actually, then the chickens are are part of the eatables. Yes. Isn't it? So, honey pie, do you grow things in your garden? Yes, I do. What do you grow? I, I like to grow lots of veg. I love growing fruit. In fact, everywhere I go, I feel like I'm planting fruit trees and um, blueberry bushes and things like that. But you have not had to do that here because this house came with a gigantic cherry tree and several blueberry bushes. Yep. And there was some other stuff that they have not turned out to be worthwhile, right? Weren't there some blackberries? But there Oh, no. there's tons of blackberries nearby. Yeah, yeah but I mean, wild ones. we had like thornless blackberry bushes, yeah, you said. But, yeah. but they never... They weren't very good. You they were, were told they were there, but yeah, they well, did not yeah. deliver. Yeah. 
So that wasn't good. Um, but yeah, so right now we've got spinach and kale and cabbage planted and zucchini. And um, of course we've got chickens, we've planted chickens. So we'll have eggs soon. Um, planted a rose bush the other day and some dahlias. I'm getting ready to put some um, zinnias in the front garden. So, oh, and some nasturtiums. And I think that's about it for right now because I'm gonna be in England for July. So I'm trying to not go crazy because Mr. Ham will have to be doing a ton of watering. Yeah, literally the entire month of July. Uh, it'll just be me and mom. So that's going to be an interesting month for Rada Runs Through. I expect I'll have to be flying solo for the next podcast as a result, folks, by the way, because Jen will literally be gone for an entire month. Uh, her and your dad sister and, and uh, her kids and your dad and aunts all doing an extended stay, doing Harry Potter stuff and who knows what else. Yep. And Jen trying to get more work done out in the <laughs> studio. So, uh, and you, with this garden that you just listed everything off, you're making up for lost time because pretty much our entire stay <laughs> in Malta, you occasionally tried and it just gave up, right? Yeah, it's just so hot and dry in Malta yep. that I just wasn't able. I bought a whole bunch of pots and yeah. gave it a go. Yeah. I, I planted a lemon tree, which didn't make it. Um, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, Malta was harsh and unforgiving. Yep. Uh, Natalie also wonders, how are the chickens doing and are the dogs being kind to them? Ah, yes. The chickens are great. Basically, I think they're about 12 weeks old now. So another eight weeks or so and we'll have some eggs. And the dogs are fine, especially now that um, they're not little cute little squeak toys anymore. <laughs> they are basically just miniature chickens. They look like, I think, what they're going to look like for the rest of their lives. But they're just a little bit small, so they'll, they'll grow and they'll fill out a bit more. But as far as their coloring and everything, they look really, really pretty. I've got... None, none of them are the same. So it's uh, quite a patchwork quilt of chickens out there. It's lovely though. Love it. So um, they're doing good. Thanks for asking. Yes, and uh, and and you got rid of the two roosters, the I, the I unexpected home. guests. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a lady I met at the uh, place that I bought the the chicks, and she said, "Hey, if you end up having any roosters, let me know." Because you can't be a hundred percent sure, apparently. No, there's some of them that don't do a a sexing of the chickens mm -hmm. of the chicks so anyway i did end up having two so i drove them out there what three weeks ago or so now Four. they were sent out to live on a farm happily ever after and they literally were yes, yes. jen confirmed this in person yep yep so this lady has 20 acres and horses and all sorts of animals that she's rescued off of the sides of roads and from glue factories and all i mean i just like oh it's such a good person yeah um, yep, and so she, her, her current rooster, she said, is 15 years old, and he was beautiful. Hmm. Um, but so the young, the young bucks will be taking over. She wants to do some breeding. All right. So, yep. Uh, third question: How did we celebrate my birthday, my big five zero? God, we did. Did we do anything? I think I had to take mom to uh, <laughs> uh, the clinic on that day. Let's look. April 17th. Going back. April 17th. Oh, yeah, no, I had to take mom in for denture fittings, so I had to do that. <laughs> and uh, there was some call to somebody in the UK to set up something. And, yeah, no, pretty much nothing. I, I, I'm just so, meh, not interested. Because, well, I took mom down to get her dentures fitted. Uh, the place where we were doing that is a hop, skip, and a jump from a Cold Stone Creamery. So I imagine, I, I cannot confirm this, I don't remember anything about the day, but I imagine I probably had a nice big, uh, whatever their large size, gotta have it is, of uh, apple pie, which mm. I absolutely love. So I pr probably that was it. Probably that was the beginning and the end of it, was that ice cream. <laughs> um, as you can see, not much for celebrating birthdays. All right, even the big five zero. Okay. <clears throat> and then we have Graham, who says... I saw you guys went to BGG Con, and I was wondering, since you're back in the States, are you going to be doing other conventions? I'd really love to meet you in person. All right, Graham. Uh, it looks like we will be going to BGG Con again in November. Whatever that is, the 20th? Ooh. The week of the 20th, I think? Just like a look. Jen is going to look. So there's that. And that's probably it. I'm not going to Origins. We talked about going to Gen Con, but remember how I just said Jen is going to spend literally the entire month of July abroad? Gen Con starts the day after she returns, 
And she said, no, I'm not going to be able to. I'm not going to be able to do it. So we might do Gen Con next year in 2020. But I think for the rest of this year, it's just BGG Con. And yeah. what were those dates, Honey Pie? November 20th through 24th. Uh, in the uh, great state of Texas. Yep. In Dallas, in a whole new venue. The Dallas Hyatt Downtown. No longer the one at the airport. And uh, Jen and I will be there. And Jen will be selling her wares. And I will be sitting nearby with a come at me bro sign because if anybody wants to play a game that's what I'm there for because well, I am a special guest of the convention which means it's pretty much my job to play games with people if they want to play. There you go. And I think it starts on the 21st. I think the 20th is a media day. Oh, okay. So. No, 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 no. Um it's you know you're you're looking at it from your perspective. It is the 20th to the 24th. It's just that the your thing, the what you call it? The vendors area? The vendors area is closed on that day. So the vendors area, I think, oh, is open three days. Okay. But the convention itself goes for four. The library and the playing area is open all four days. I think that's the way it works. Okay, well, but Wednesday is the 20th. And that, so that's five days through oh. the 24th. Well, then maybe I'm wrong. Well, you know what, folks? You can go on Board Game Geek, Or you can just do a search for BGG Con 2019. And uh, get all this skinny because, obviously, I am an unreliable witness. <laughs> all right. So that was it. Except for now, circling back to Kate, who wants to hear about Game of Thrones. Honey, do you have anything to say about the final season of Game of Thrones? No, I don't. No, she stopped sometime in season two. Yeah. She said, this is too much for me. Why did you stop watching Game of Thrones, honey? You did oh. watch the entire first season. Yeah, I know. And I used to, I liked it. It was just too much violence. Mm -hmm. Too much fighting and, I don't know. And, angst and stress mm -hmm. so that's why all righty well like kate i thought they wrapped it up great and um i have no complaints at all anybody who, uh, oh, by the way folks uh, total spoilers from now on if you don't want any final season of game of thrones spoilers then once again i say thanks for listening have a very nice day talk to you later so long bye bye but by now it's been weeks surely everybody who cares will have seen it by now um, although maybe you just never watched anything and you're planning on, oh, someday I'll watch the whole thing. And somehow you avoided spoilers. That's impossible to me. Uh, yet somehow Jen avoids spoilers. Jen has no idea what's going on outside of the glass world. Uh, but anyway, um, what was I going to say? Right, so, the, uh, you know, Daenerys' final turn, I thought, was very well um, established in this season. And, you know, going all the way back to the beginning, back to her response to the death of her brother, that indicated what kind of person she could be. And so, um, how she ultimately ended up was should have been no surprise to anybody. And anybody who complains that it was not established well, or that um, Arya, um, or, or, you know, her finale with the Night King was not established, they were not paying attention. Now, to be fair, that's understandable. What with the occasional two years between seasons, maybe you kind of lose track of everything that happens. But I thought they did a brilliant job of setting up everything. And, um, you know, everybody complaining about, oh, well, the showrunners didn't know what they were doing after the books ended. Oh, I, won't. I was about to be rude, but I will not. I will respectfully disagree with that very silly um, point of view. One, the most obvious thing, is of course George R. R. Martin has gone on record multiple times saying that he did tell them everything that happened, so they weren't just making it up as they went along. They were still sticking to the particulars. And um, that aside, many of people's favorite moments of all time, uh, you know, in, in the entire series, have happened when they were, quote, off script. So that has just become a very convenient scapegoat for people who are just bitter that the series didn't end the way they wanted it to end. Because if you're a true fan of Game of Thrones, you recognize and understand that the show, or the, the books, have always been about subverting audience expectations and not giving you what you want, not giving you the ending for Jon Snow that should have been prophesized, completely ignoring the prophecy while we're at it, too, because prophecies are bunk. Um, you know, all of that. Um, Things that seemed to be important weren't important. Other things that seemed incidental were what everything was about. Because that's how life is, and that's how Game of Thrones is, and people are just upset. Now, another reason I think people are upset is because they are failing to understand that, yes, there has been a tonal shift over this season and the preceding season. And it's not because the showrunners didn't know what they were doing because they didn't have George R.R. R. Martin's blueprint, because they did have George R.R. R. Martin's blueprint. Again, has been so repeatedly made clear... That aside, the reason there has been a shift is because with these two seasons, we are in the third and final act of a 10-year story. 
or, or however many books it is. I don't, I don't know. You know, ten seasons. Was it seven or eight books? Um, these last two seasons were the final act, and in any good story, the final season accelerates. Things speed up as we rush ever more rapidly, ever more quickly to a conclusion. The final act of Die Hard does not have John McClane sitting around in the bathroom for another hour talking on the walkie-talkie mm -hmm. about his marriage. They did that in the early part of the movie. The final act is him facing off against Han Gruber and he can barely walk. Hans! Holly! You know, it speeds up. That's what third acts are supposed to do. And anybody who complains about, wow, it seems like they've really sped up. They clearly don't know what they're doing. This has always been a slow and thoughtful show, doesn't understand dramatic narrative structure. Anyway, that's what I feel. Um, I thought they did a brilliant job. So many amazing moments. I would say the only misstep, and it's not really a misstep, it was just kind of a bit of a frustration for me, is in um, uh, The Long Night. I was, I, for that episode, I had just gotten a new projector bulb for our Epsom 8350 projector. Because uh, they are bulb, you know, I mean, they, they go they, they go dim. They go, you have to replace them every couple of years. And I'd just gotten it, and I'd set it up, and it was working great, and I was going to watch on the big screen, you know, the, the big final um, confrontation. And as you know, that episode is very dark. And unfortunately, even with my new bulb, it was too dark to watch on the big 120-inch um, screen, so I had to watch on the regular TV, and that was kind of a bummer. But, I mean, once I watched on the regular TV, everything was perfectly fine. I could see everything okay. I don't know what people were complaining about. that it, You know, it was easy to follow. Um, yeah. I have that's, that's my one complaint. I thought everything else was beautifully done. The send-off for all the characters was perfect. And, uh, yeah. It, 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 they stuck the landing in the best way possible. And that's my, um, oh, I didn't get spoiler rich, did I? I was still kind of vague, wasn't I? But that's okay. Because maybe somebody against their better judgment listened and I hopefully haven't spoiled too terribly much other than to say it was all awesome. Um, but anyway, that's my response to people complaining. All the complaints are silly and ridiculous. Uh, most of those complaints could be leveled at any year that you want. The same way all the complaints against Last Jedi, I could, I could level at any Star Wars film, including uh, Empire Strikes Back the sacred cow. Uh, and it's just people grousing because they weren't given what they wanted. And they forgot this was a show that goes out of its way to not give you what you want. And so that was Game of Thrones. Awesome ender. Thanks for the question, Kate. And now we are truly done. And we'll be back next month, although maybe not all of us. Uh, again, <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, you literally fly out on, um, on the, the final day, right? Wait. Yes. What, what, what day do you fly out? I fly July 1st, and I come back on... I thought you flew out uh, at the end of June. Like uh, at midnight no, or something. I, uh, no. I, because of the time zone difference. Well, maybe Jen will appear in the next because I will we'll record the Q&A the day before she goes or mm, something like yeah, that. Yeah, we could do that like on Saturday the 29th. Perhaps. But... That's only if you guys step up. Where's the questions? Questions at questionsatrado.com. Uh, you ask them, we'll answer them, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye. 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 Bye.